somehow it seems that Satan is more active today than maybe even sometimes in the past. But uh, certainly he's active through communism, through the you know, Black Lives Matter or burning, looting, uh, murdering, as other people describe it. She, her, hers, he, him, his. I've been a fan of Tucker for years on uh, various uh, cable news shows, but it's such a thrill that he's on at 8 o'clock every night on the Fox News channel. You're listening to the Fakertarians podcast. Fuck Tucker Carlson. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 17 of the Fakertarians podcast. I'm your host, John Hudak, along with Jeremy Kantorowitz, Jordan Logue, and Archie Flower. Trying something a little different today. This is our Lou Rockwell Christmas special. How do you guys feel about that? I I am ready to to have a Christmas party with Lou. <laughs> Lou couldn't be here today, but we got some of his old uh, articles in this place. Okay. Let's see what one we're going to go He's to. He's here first. in spirit. Kind of like... like... <laughs> All of the other spirits that visited Ebenezer Scrooge. (laughs) The spirit of alt-right past. (laughs) So for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Lou Rockwell, he runs LouRockwell.com. He uh, founded the Mises Institute. He's worked for Ron Paul in various capacities over the years. Um, He's been accused, and it seems like a pretty credible accusation, of writing the uh, Ron Paul newsletters that gained so much controversy. Um, so we'll start with his article from, I think it was 1991 about the Rodney King riots. So I'm going to read this thing in full cause it's, it's a pretty short one. It's called it's safe streets versus urban terror in the fifties. Rampant crime didn't exist because offenders feared what the police would do. So this was published in the LA times by a supposed libertarian. If you offer a small boy, one candy bar now or 10 tomorrow, he'll grab the one. That's because children have what economists call a high time preference. They want it and they want it now. The future is a haze. The punishing of children must take this into account. One good whack on the bottom can have an effect. A threat about no TV all next year will not. As we grow older, this changes. We care more and think more about the future. In fact, this is the very process of maturation. We plan, save, invest, and put off today's gratification until tomorrow. But street criminals, as economist Murray Ann Rothbard points out, have the time preference of depraved infants. The prospect of a jail sentence 12 months from now has virtually no effect. As recently as the 1950s, when street crime was not rampant in America, the police always operated on this principle. No matter the vagaries of the court system, a mugger or rapist knew he faced a trouncing proportionate to the offense in the offender in the back of the paddy wagon and maybe even a repeat performance at the station house. As a result, criminals were terrified of the cops and our streets were safe. Today's criminals know that they probably won't be convicted and that if they are, they face a short sentence someday. The result is city terrorism, though we are seldom shown videos of old people being mugged, women being raped, gangs shooting drivers at random, or store clerks having their throats slit. What we do see over and over again is the tape of some Los Angeles area cops giving the what for to an ex-con. It is not a pleasant sight, of course. Neither is cancer surgery. Did they hit him too many times? Sure, but that's not the issue. It's safe streets versus urban terror and why we have moved from one to the other. Liberals talk about banning guns. As a libertarian, I can't agree. I am, however, beginning to wonder about video cameras. So here we have Lou Rockwell basically justifying police brutality in relation to the Rodney King riots. Does that surprise anyone? Justifying? Yeah. That, that's more than justifying. That's begging <laughs> for. <laughs> that's, I mean, he compared it to cancer surgery. Cancer surgery generally would be seen as a good thing. I mean, I, I really wouldn't be comparing police beatings to cancer surgery. He's saying it's like well, a necessary thing, basically. Man, the, the my thing is, sorry, I, I didn't ahead. really hear anything from that article, but my dog just like screamed and ran out of the room, like <laughs> trying to cover his ears. Ah. Ah. So like Here's I said, thing, that was it, from... Go on. He, I mean, he's calling for... Or he doesn't come out and call for it, but he's just like, I can't call for the banning of guns, but I'm tired of like seeing this. So maybe we shouldn't film it as much like that's that's more than just like support of police in what they're doing, which is if we're going to be honest about it. It's ignoring the fact that the police state as it exists has caused the criminal like 
cause the police to criminalize behaviors that are not victimizing. So we're calling for, you know, this we're calling for order in the streets by by supporting the police without realizing that the supporting the police in enforcing laws that are putting victimless crimes, the people who perpetrate victimless crimes in jail. And just completely so this, ignoring that part of it. Yeah. So this whole thing was uh, part of the paleo strategy of the early 1990s. I think maybe it started in the late 80s with with uh, Murray Rothbard and Lou Rockwell. The basic idea was to try to appeal to basically what's kind of like the alt-right today, like the, the racist, I don't know, nationalist kind of kind of group. Um, and try to get them to appeal to, or try to appeal to libertarian principles to them. But I mean, it looks like he's sacrificing libertarian principles in the process, but that's what this was. That's what the Ron Paul newsletters were. But let's go to something a little bit more recent because I honestly think the paleo strategy is kind of repeating itself today with mm -hmm. trying to appeal to Trump supporters. Cause I've kind of noticed, I've followed Rockwell over the years and I've had his quirks at the very least, but I feel like he's really stepped up the paleo stuff a lot since Trump rose up. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to read this whole thing, but there's this thing he wrote on November 9th, 2020. President Trump, you are still president. <laughs> it starts with President Trump, you won the election, but the deep state leftists are trying to cheat you out of victory. <laughs> he goes All on right. talking today about in conservatives versus math. <laughs> 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 oh, he goes on talking oh, wow. about how the deep state is undermining him by using the phony COVID-19 crisis to wreck the economy, talking about how face masks prevent people from breathing. Um, <laughs> he's, Rockwell says that, he, that Trump should urge people not to take the vaccine and that Trump should continue to denounce and to act against the Black Lives Matter and Antifa thugs who are rioting and looting. Also, I thought this was an interesting one. I, I have some notes right here. I started on my notes. The heartland of America stands opposed to the coastal elites, illegal immigrants, and disaffected minority groups who seek to exploit the rest of us. Let's Lou, just let you that can save us all some time. time and just say the N-word. We all hear it. <laughs> That's an awful lot of words we're just wanting to, yeah. <laughs> And then finally, remember that Joe Biden is not the legitimate president. You are. Like, I get the idea of a libertarian thinking that Joe Biden's not going to be the legitimate president because, like, he shouldn't be ruling over us. But that doesn't make Trump the legitimate president. That's, right. The idea for a libertarian there should be there is not a legitimate president, not Trump is, Biden isn't. Yeah, that, that, that's a well, good you're assuming right that libertarianism is his guiding principle. We have 30 years of evidence that libertarianism is, is not his guiding principle. White supremacy is. And he wants Trump like, to set up a uh, he wants Trump to set up a White House in exile if he's forced out on January 20th. Yeah, he can uh, use the West Wing set. <laughs> they deconstruct that or i you know i kind of always pictured because you people talk about trump possibly setting up like a trump tv and uh you know and you know his own propaganda network him just sitting at a, a fake oval office set and just spewing you know whatever bullshit he has to spew that day and i can totally see all of his supporters paying 5.99 a month to subscribe to that just and including Lou, it would be more than five ninety nine a month. We both know that. That's true. He is tricking everybody into. He know, does have legal. Paying him <laughs> he is tricking everybody to pay him like a hundred bucks a month for the next year through his his donation text. So, so we have some interesting comments coming in right now from the live viewers. I had heard bad things about you morons, but it's easy to determine that you are really total scum upon close examination. Well, thanks, Bob. Thanks, okay. buddy. So, Have fun with um <laughs> wonderful. Total scum. Wow. Appreciate That's, it. Okay. <laughs> maybe he so, thought we so were screw off with the non-aggression principle, you know. Maybe he thought the, the Lou Rockwell article was us was were like our words. Oh, that's probably, you know, that's probably actually it. That's totally <laughs> what it was. That makes sense. That I would understand. I mean, yeah. Sorry, sorry for the misunderstanding, Bob. It's okay, Bob. So the other link, I saw this uh today. 
Lou Rockwell does this thing on his site sometimes. Where he'll just like post like a little blurb about another link, and it's usually like another article or something like that. This one, it it really kind of tells me that there's no principle here. At I mean, not that I didn't know this, but there's no principle here at all in his pandering to Trump supporters. Literally, the thing he linked to was a video just Trump giving a Christmas speech. It's just president. The headline is President Trump thanks God for sending his son to redeem the world. Like I don't. Do you, what, do you think he would have done that for like Obama or something? Like, <laughs> I mean, it, it literally, literally was the most, yeah, the most generic Christmas speech ever. Like, it just <laughs> standard boy of plate Christmas speech, and it's, it's not like, like a libertarian Christmas speech. Like, it's not like right. there was nothing know. you there was nothing unique about it, and what in any way whatsoever when i watched it i was like, like it's something okay. you'd expect from like oan or something like that or like <laughs> news max tv or some shit yeah okay so then here's what i got next i didn't have this one in the show notes but i thought it was funny it was an it was a little like two paragraph article he cited from thomas de lorenzo or he published from thomas de lorenzo called when did the nfl become pro-trump and it's like uh it's being sarcastic saying like because the NFL players have things on the back of their helmet that say stop the hate. And he's like, he's like the, the, the radical Marxist left is encouraging all the hate against Trump. And he's talking about the, we hate America and Americans gang that still routinely protest the national anthem before games. I don't, I don't know what relevance this has to a supposed libertarian site, but. <laughs> it also <laughs> indicates that someone doesn't really watch a lot of NFL games. <laughs> 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 so the next little blurb for an article he linked to this is from october 12th 2020 new photographic evidence shows the truth about blm martyr brianna taylor he links to an article from uh someone i've clashed with in the past uh shane trejo i don't know if anyone if any of you guys have read into him before i think he used to write for like the liberty conservative or something like that but um the the article the the headline of the ar- actual article he links to is new photographic evidence shows BLM martyr Brianna Taylor was a drug dealing gun brandishing thug and it just has pictures of Brianna I have it, I have it right here in black and white but it just has pictures of Brianna Taylor with guns and like some pictures of drugs as if I, I don't know what, what that's supposed to signify it's like oh no she she's a gun owner like. That I was going to say, sound... don't libertarians inherently support gun ownership and drug legalization? Isn't that like right. one of the things Standard, that we you know, are here for? Yes. But not, right. not when we're trying to own the libs. <laughs> or when they're yeah. black. That's I, Again, we're yeah. coming back to yeah. this. It, it, libertarianism doesn't matter to this guy so much as God almighty, he just does not like black people. <laughs> So he had this uh, kind of article summing up the paleo strategy. I'm going. I'm going back to the uh, to 1991. I think it is talking about how we need a fusion of libertarianism and conservatism. Um, complaining about like how many. I don't know if he used the word degenerates, but that's basically what he said throughout the article. Complaining about how many libertarians are degenerates and how he wants libertarianism to have a better cultural tone um, talking about how this is this one made my dog bark too. wishing to associate with members of one's own race, nationality, religion, class, sex, or even political party is a natural and normal like, human impulse. I like how the top line is the greenhouse effect. Um, <laughs> as if that's oh, yeah. like myth or myth or danger. No, it's, that's not, we have greenhouses. That's real. We know that it's real. <laughs> and that's another. That's a, another common theme um, when it comes to uh, what, let's think, what surrounds we, him. Who do we think he's trying to pander to here? There is nothing wrong with blacks. No, no, no. Blacks. There's no pandering. <laughs> this, this is this isn't no. pandering. Come on, this is this just is, libertarianism. It's only pandering if it's to the left. There is nothing wrong with blacks preferring the black thing, but paleo libertarians would say the same thing about whites preferring the white thing. I'll leave it at that. (laughs) Okay. This is a, here's a funny one here. So I made a little post about this pre-show 
about uh, Lou Rockwell complaining about Mighty Ducks 2. And yeah. it's a real thing. So he was complaining that Mighty Ducks 2 is anti-white. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so th this the article is called, Why is the Ice Still White? I think this is from 1993 or so. How do you make a PC <laughs> movie about ice hockey, an inherently non-PC topic? Non-PC because everybody in the sport is a white male. So then he goes, he goes on a bit. He's complaining about Emilio Estevez's uh, acting. And then, but he says, like, he learned to appreciate the acting as compared to the anti-white bias. So let me read a little bit of a, a little bit of a passage here from that. The movie starts in Minnesota, where all the Scandinavian and Wasp boys play hockey. But not only is the actor playing the coach Latino, his team is composed of Blacks, Hispanics, Asians, including a gay Chinese figure skater, an American Indian, and this is in italics, girls. As if we have, and in reality, in Minnesota, we have none of those. There's no <laughs> girls, no gay Chinese figure skaters, no Latin people, no, none, none no, it's whatsoever. Just a bunch of white dudes. And yep. I would like to point out that this is uh, leaving out the fact that the goalie of that of the hockey oh, team getting, was named. I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it. Don't okay, good. Because I'm. <laughs> so then, then the erasure complain. will not be tolerated. <laughs> <laughs> Then he complains about how there were black kids that teach them new shots and strategies that they need for victory. And he says, and it's all to the tune, if you'll excuse the expression of the rap, whoop, there it is. <laughs> and then <laughs> he says later, also saving the day is a girl goalie and the coach's dark haired girlfriend whom he chooses over an evil blonde from Iceland. There is some great skating in the stunt kids who play the actual hockey are credited at the end. Strange, but I didn't notice one female, Asian, or Hispanic name among them. This was in the Rothbard Rockwell report. It was a libertarian a libertarian newsletter that used to go out. Yeah, with other such great hits like A New Look at the Holocaust. <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> that's for for legal purposes that's not actually in there but it wouldn't surprise me if it was um <laughs> no it's actually the in their Wait. last issue <laughs> are, are you serious yeah i thought that was a joke okay so no I mean, no that is in their very last issue not, lou didn't write it but um yeah i i just it? found it when when i was poking through and yeah <laughs> oof who wrote that? I wonder if there's a reason a why that was the last the, issue. Yeah, I was going to make a joke about the goalie from the Mighty Ducks being Jewish, and then you come out with the fucking, no, really, they're making fun of the Holocaust now. So, like, <laughs> the joke is, <laughs> you ruined this joke. Jesus. Sorry, Jordan. So then from another uh, issue of the... By Rock the way, shout out to Goldberg. He was the, he was the goalie from the Mighty Ducks. That was the best character. I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was looking. We were looking through the uh, the archives of the Rothbard Rockwell report. That's how we kind of stumbled upon all these. But here's another one right here. This is a little blurb I can read because we all know that libertarians hate it when illegal immigrants can drive because that's very that's a very libertarian principle. So I'll, I'll read this: Illegal aliens want driver's licenses because of a leftist lawsuit. For four weeks, New Jersey, New Jersey issued driver's licenses to illegal aliens, and there was a flood. Americans were forced to wait up to four hours in line because of the aliens. Two immigration lawyers have now filed suit to restore the practice, claiming that the rotten 14th Amendment guarantees them licenses, even if they are breaking the immigration laws. It's very, it, it's very libertarian, because we all know that libertarians are all about people not being able to drive. I, well, we we care. Care. They yeah. especially care especially... so much for licensing. Yeah. Right. That's a big part of it. And like borders. And we know that if you break the law, you shouldn't be able to drive. That's, that's what we say. Right. That's I think, I, I think it goes NAP and then, yeah, if you break the law, no driving. I think that's like <laughs> the first two parts of libertarianism. And, 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 backwards. and, and no yeah, minorities yeah, playing hockey. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah, if we can go back to that, did he really complain that there were no Hispanics on the Iceland hockey team? Was that a thing that he actually was like hung up about? Let me find it. Let me find it. Uh, no, he was saying that 
he was trying to make some like great point about how the actual skaters who did the skating during the movie weren't Hispanic. Ah, like the the uh, the stunt. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, he okay. Says, yeah, because he's like, oh well, since we didn't have any Hispanic stunt kids, how can they have Hispanics in the movie? Checkmate, libs. Some shit like that. Okay, what else do we got here? Oh, this is a good one. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but uh, well, I'll, I'll read his little part because he had a lot of quotes. Um, it's called Work, Obey, and Eat. During the 1930s. What? You, uh, oh, just wait. <laughs> Actually, Work, can one of you guys. Obey, and Eat? No, that, that's, the, that's the title of this little blurb right here. Actually, I got to pull something wow. up real quick. Give me one second. Where's that? Okay, so here we go. Okay, so here's what he said about this. During the 1930s, New Deal historians compiled a 19-volume oral history of slavery. It consisted, in, it consisted entirely of interviews with former slaves, and given the interest in the subject, one would think the collection, still in print, would be much in use today. But an extract before freedom, edited by Belinda Hermans, shows why the oral history is so seldom used. Fewer than 4% of the ex-slaves expressed even the slightest hostility to slavery, former masters, or whites in general. So then he has some quotes from slaves that said there was a lot of love between master and slave, and slavery was better for us than things is now in some cases. Um, I think slavery was a mighty good thing for mother, father, me, and the other members of my family. So he has, he has quotes from, from actual slaves. I, I will say that, but who's he trying to uh, appeal to and <laughs> saying that slavery wasn't that bad. And just the, I want to, I want to note that the person who actually compiled these wasn't making some big statement about slaves liking slavery. Um, she said in the introduction that the former slaves seeming nostalgia for old times might have resulted from their ages because they were all over 80 at the time of their interviews and depression linked poverty because it was in the 1930s. The reality yeah, that I was going to say, if this, was, if this was done in the 1930s, it was at least 70 plus years since the end of slavery. So and then, you're, you're asking people who were at minimum 71, 72, 73 years old what they're early childhood was like let's say childhood right. yeah and then and she also said that the reality that freedom often meant sharecropping and violence from the kkk and the fact that their interviewers were white so it's not that it's not that slavery was good or something which i don't know apparently the point is lou rockwell is trying to say oh they actually liked it but it's that they had to deal with a bunch of crap afterwards too like obviously they're both terrible well, I mean, if if his point is going to be, go ahead. I I think Lou Rockwell watched Django Unchained and thinks every slave acted like the Samuel L. Jackson character. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say that, like, if his point was to be, like, if he's trying to make the commentary that, like, the New Deal was ineffective for these reasons. You can do that without saying, by the way, a government that literally treats you as not only, you know, disposable, but as actual property and not a human. The only part he mentioned about the New Deal was New Deal historians. The uh, the whole explanation of it being like depression related was from the actual compiler. So he just he just put out a bunch of uh, things about there about how about slaves saying slavery was better. <laughs> like and why do you think you would do that he didn't just wake up one day and be like i'm gonna put these words on a page <laughs> it's just food for thought what else do we have here oh yeah the real rosa parks talking about oh, how no. oh god oh yeah oh yeah no this was <laughs> october 1994 in the rothbard rockwell report oh. so He's talking about he's complaining about white liberals. Um, he's talking about he, he was explaining the Montgomery ordinance where the one uh, she was arrested for about how it was just that. Um, what was it? Blacks and whites could not sit across from each other. Like somehow that makes it better. It wasn't it wasn't that they had to get up. I, I don't I don't even know. But apparently they asked supporting local legislation against black people to own the libs. 
<laughs> oh yeah, no, he gets to that too, and he talks about how uh, the high school Rosa Parks went to was a a training camp for socialists and communists. Um, oh yeah, because Alabama public schools were just just a hotbed of all Marxist thought as they remain to this day. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's there's uh there's some more segments here. Parks may have thought she was leading an authentic movement against petty segregation in doing so on behalf of blacks, but she was merely playing a scripted part in a much much larger drama that had nothing to do with her and everything to do with the power and malice of white liberals. The end result was increased racial hatred and less real freedom for everyone, a far different result than if the dispute had been settled honestly, locally, and constitutionally. And so back up a moment. Yeah. Did he did he characterize Jim Crow as petty segregation? It seems that way. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and this was, you know, 94. Uh when yes. when when October he can't be accused of having totally lost his his mind. No, this is October <laughs> 1994. I mean, like the the case could be made today that he's just totally gone crazy over the edge, but in 94, he was saying this stuff. That's, that's... Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, and there's, don't, yeah, don't worry, there's more. I'm going to read another. Uh, I was going to say, uh, oh, wait, there's more. We can't accuse, <laughs> yeah, we can't accuse like him getting older and like the cognitive decline that comes from age as being like why he's saying overtly racist things. This is, this is an ongoing issue and it has been since probably 30 ish years at least that we have on record at minimum. Right. I'm going to read the last two little paragraphs of this article here. Limited and localized segregation is gone, but a vast system of racial compulsion has been erected in its place. In the process, social authority has been crushed, crushed, grievously injuring civil society in the Montgomery. Oh, this is a, this is a great one. Just wait for this. In the Montgomery of 39 years ago, the worst fear was of bus deceiding. Today in Detroit, theft and mayhem are the norm. Rosa Parks wasn't in danger of being beaten by the bus driver, but at the end of her life and of the civil rights movement, which she allegedly began, she isn't safe locked up in her own home. Holy shit. <laughs> and she was is, beaten this is by the police, you asshole. But not the <laughs> okay. bus driver. It's okay. Well, as long as the bus driver doesn't do 40 it. 40 well, years outside of 94 makes it 54, right? So he's saying that she had nothing to fear in 54. He and said, I just yeah. Googled this. Um, so Emmett Till died in, in 55. Oh my and God. I think we all know what happened to him. Yeah, that was it. For so, anyone who yeah, doesn't I'm know. I'm safe was... for Black Americans I thought about back it. then, Lou. Yeah, I thought about it. Um, just, just kind of realized that, like, we talked about it earlier that he doesn't actually care if black people are beaten by police. So I realized that, like, he's not gonna care if Rosa Parks would face police brutality for sitting in the wrong seat on a bus or anything yeah, else it, that happened during the summer. Is it even brutality in his head? I mean, right. To, to to be, well, Frank, it sounds like to him, they're just children that deserve the spanking. And and the police are just, you know, daddy. Yeah, well, I mean, she she was, they were, I mean, they were just petty segregation laws, you know. Just, I, I can't believe it's a petty segregation. And he, I, he talks I, about how she was already an activist in left liberal causes, extensively trained in radical politics. Um, the radicalism she, of the idea of equality. Yeah. Oh, no. And she worked closely with the city's most powerful white liberal who specialized in defending accused communists. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all white men are created equal. That's Lou Rockwell's uh, annotated Declaration of Independence. <laughs> God almighty. Okay. What else do we got here? Oh yeah. This is, I think this is the last article I have. Um, so this is about, <clears throat> it's kind of, it kind of draws a parallel to Trump for me with how they're getting uh, more in favor of Trump. It's 
for President Pat Buchanan by Murray Ann Rothbard and Lou Rockwell Jr. They talk about how, because especially because there's a lot of parallels between uh, Buchanan and Trump with the whole the tariffs thing, the nationalism, the the whole anti-immigration thing. Talking about how Pat Buchanan is their ideal candidate. He stands for America First, which I'm pretty sure is the name of Nick Fuentes' podcast. Fun fact. Um, and I thought it was funny. He ends it with this. We have a dream, and perhaps someday it will come to pass. Hell, if doctor, he has doctor in quotes here. Hell, if Dr. King can have a dream, why can't we? Our dream is that one day we Buchananites can present Mr. and Mrs. America and all the liberal and conservative and centrist elites with a dramatic choice. We can, in the scintillating terms of Tom Wolf, Mao Meow, Mao Mao? I don't know what that means. The flak catchers, except using its leftist Mao Meow, except usually its leftist Meow Meowing liberals. We can say, look, gang, you have a choice. It's either Pat Buchanan or David Duke. If you don't vote for us, baby, you're going to get Duke. And how do you like them apples? Fun fact, too, the next article in that January 1992 uh, issue of the Rothbard Rockwell report is Murray Rothbard's right wing populism, which starts with, well, they finally got David Duke, but he sure scared the bejesus out of them. <laughs> We're breaking Hudak's rule about not talk, talking about late Roth, uh, Rothbard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I thought we didn't talk about late Rothbard. <laughs> we do today. I'm just it's doing a it Christmas special. Come on, you know, yeah. we've got to drop the rules for the special, right? I mean, <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, you were right about the uh, uh, Fuentes's. Um, I googled that. It is America First, the podcast yeah, title. That's always been a common term in those circles, and it's never – it's not like America first uh, – what's the word? Motivated by some kind of libertarian ideology. It's like more of a not liking foreigners America first. Yeah. It's it's the uh, nationalistic um, country above uh, everything else tribalism. Mm -hmm. And that's where, the, that's where the whole immigration thing comes from with their – they're all super against immigration. Unless they're from Northern Europe. <laughs> well, <laughs> come on. You've got to give they... them that. Europe is for Europeans, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> is, is that wrong? It's just a cultural so. preference. Oh, yeah. Isn't it just a cultural preference? Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> He's from the Middle East. Our our one comment is going to be from is from the guy who didn't know whether or not we were joking when we read his fucking article, and you guys are saying shit like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, if 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 someone tunes into this and doesn't realize we are anti racists in the right, 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 right. Um, non woke sense, but the actual you know thinking, engaging brain sense, then uh, I don't know what to tell you. It's funny you talked about the whole immigration thing with wanting people from Europe, though, because it, it reminded me of how uh, Hoppe, because we can move to some other, uh, I don't have anything prepared for him, but we can we could talk about him a little bit, about how he wants IQ tests for immigrants from the state. Yeah, Let me see if I can find that. Specifically tailored tests that completely encapsulate a you know it with a goal of 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 obtaining only one certain demographic the you know northern europeans and and somehow that's just super libertarian like i just don't understand how anybody can look at it and and think that's remotely libertarian but what's um Hop what's gun girl's Hop. name caitlin bennett okay now she just recently wore Trump is my king, right? That, on a so, shirt. Yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, Liberty yeah, Hangout yeah. shirt. How how yeah. long until like Hoppa is my king comes out? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I'm gonna I have that uh, passage from Democracy the God that fail up because a lot of people doubt that Hoppa actually was calling for state enforced IQ tests, but I'm gonna I'm gonna read this one off. What should one advocate as the relatively correct immigration policy, however, as long as the democratic central state is still in place and successfully irrigates the power to determine a uniform national immigration policy? 
the best one may hope for, even if it goes against the nature of a democracy, and this is not very likely to happen, is that the democratic rulers act as if they were the personal owners of the country and as if they had to decide who to include and who to exclude from their own personal property into their very own houses. This means following a policy of the strictest discrimination in favor of the human qualities of skill, character, and cultural compatibility. I'm, I'm getting to it. More specifically, it means distinguishing strictly between citizens, naturalized immigrants, and resident aliens, and excluding the latter from all welfare entitlements. It means requiring for resident aliens, resident alien status as well as for citizenship, the personal sponsorship by a re resident citizen and his assumption of liability for all property damage caused by the immigrant. It implies requiring an existing employment contract with a resident citizen. Moreover, for both categories, but especially that of citizenship, here we go, it implies that all immigrants must demonstrate through tests not only English language profic proficiency, but all around superior above average intellectual performance and character structure, as well as a compatible system of values with the predictable result of a systematic pro-European immigration bias. That's not only like, that's not just asking about like your IQ. That's asking for like a personality profile. Mm -hmm. That's that's straight so up he's eugenic. asking for your resume and your Tinder app, like all in one there. <laughs> and is that's, trying that's to swipe left on everyone genesis. who's not white. But I noticed they don't want these these hoppians. They don't want the state to act like a private property owner in like any area besides immigration. Have you noticed right. that? They won't be like, oh well, some property owners wouldn't want guns on their property, so we shouldn't be able to carry guns in public. Or they won't be like, oh, well, some property owners would want masks on their property, so we should have a public property mask mandate. It's literally pretty much across the board only for immigration. And I, I wonder why that is. You don't I really mean, wonder. Come on. <laughs> really I mean, wonder. It, because, it's, because usually people don't ask them how they feel about integrated schools. Like, that's why they bring it up, because they don't feel like they can get away with saying what they're thinking. But yeah, if we're talking about like IQ tests and, and you know, you can say what you want about IQ tests uh, not being accurate because they're really not. Or you can say what you want about like, you know, value tests for like whether or not someone's going to live in a country. There's like not ter terribly many values that can be held up as objectively true because we can say as libertarians, like we value gun ownership, but that's not a universal principle. You can say that we value like low or no taxes but that's obviously not a universal principle you can't tell people who don't agree with you on every political topic that they don't have a right to live in the same geographic location as you if they harm you or don't harm anyone around you but hoppa wants the state to do that while the state exists and if you say if you say something like well i'm against this but i want the state to do it while the state exists it's basically saying i want the state to do this indefinitely because well, i mean I don't think this. I want it to be abolished. Yeah, okay, I don't I mean, think the state is going to be abolished at any time soon. Yeah, right. You can't hold the principle that like I am an anarchist, but so long as the government exists, it must act in this fascist way. Exactly. Now that just means that, like that does not mean that you're an anarchist. That means that thing. you're a fascist with dreams. That's <laughs> right. <like. laughs> right. Yeah, because well, when does he think the state's going to end? Does he think it's going to end 10 years from now? I don't think so. I don't think it's going to end in the next 100 years. I mean, it'd be cool if it did, but... Right. I mean, it, you, you know, you mentioned, you know, they only want to do it for immigration. You, you, you can apply the same kinds of arguments to other things, like guns. Somebody gets shot, they go to the hospital, you know, the um, medical industry is heavily subsidized and you know lots of money passes from government to the medical industry so we better outlaw guns so nobody gets shot and waste government medical resources as they exist or outlawing fast we can, food right right fast food you know the you know obesity and you know actually the government should probably just deliver food boxes to our door that are perfectly you know tailored to you know our, an individual's needs otherwise it might just um, end up 
wasting government money and in, in in the medical industry. I I just you you can apply that to almost everything, but for some reason it's just immigration and literally nothing else. And you we, know, the rest we of that's right. where we should have to wear helmets while we play soccer because if we get injured, it could it could hurt uh, the medical industry. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. then you start getting into the net taxpayer argument, which these idiots occasionally bring up without realizing that if we went by the net taxpayer argument, California would have way more power over the U.S. than it already does. <laughs> and they would be absolutely horrified by that. But they never think that far through it. Yeah, they complain about Facebook, but like Zuckerberg would be running the country. <laughs> That's not well, I mean, he'd be sharing it with Bill Gates and Elon Musk. <laughs> And Bezos. <laughs> right, which they would be, if we talked about like the net taxpayer argument, they would be utterly horrified by what that would look like. Because right. the top, like, I mean, they complain about Soros now, but imagine if Soros actually got political power relative to the taxes he pays. <laughs> King Soros. Right. Or, you know, pre, yeah, or, you know, property or a share of, yeah, or share of, of what's now public property. I mean, which... I guess, you know, early Rothbard would would chime in and go, no, the, the worker should just, you know, fucking seize Amazon. I mean, that would be his argument there. But nobody. They, but late they, Rothbard they, would call that communist. <laughs> right. Nobody, <laughs> you know, it seems, yeah, the you know, early Rothbard definitely disappears from from this whole chain of of of. Um, of thoughts beginning beginning with this whole paleo strategy and it just it. it you see it just disappear and nobody brings it up. Or if you do, it's just communism. Well, that's uh, where the unleash the cops thing came from. It was literally that last Lou Rockwell article I read. The next article right after that is the one where Rothbard talks about clearing the streets of bums and where will they go? Who cares? And uh, we can, I'm super excited for the LAPD to clear the streets of anyone not wearing a mask and then have them support this. <laughs> well, it's it's public property, and they should treat it like a private property owner would, right? Right. For yeah, the it, record, anyone listening to this in the future, when I'm interviewing for jobs at universities, I support wearing masks. Please don't find me for this. Don't start <laughs> that with me. <laughs> if you're listening to this, if you're going out in public, put on a fucking mask until the pandemic is over, you assholes. <laughs> they're gonna just find that little clip and you're gonna be relegated to writing for lourockwell.com <laughs> oh <laughs> now jordan well, would be able to write a thing right there's, there's like, hey listen been... if i take joseph mercola's job i can fucking live with that i want that <laughs> bastard to starve <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, that, I was gonna say that kind of links right to, you know, when it comes to some of this, some of the stuff that that's being published to a site today. It's yeah, you got Mercola writing things and yeah, do, does the coronavirus really exist? Um, and Jordan, for the record, you're you're smart and all medical sciency. Um, when they when you hear libertarians talk about and push this whole well PCR tests, um, you know oh we don't have the entire piece of the virus and or the entire um, sequence of the virus, so therefore we don't know if the virus really exists or it's not right or they're doing too many PCR cycles. Can you give kind of a little bit of a breakdown on that just uh, just so people kind of know uh, what what's being put out there and kind of put that to rest. Yeah, so um, a PCR is – it's an abbreviation for the polymerase chain reaction. It's how you can take a piece of genetic material and replicate it over and over again by artificially simulating the cell cycle or how DNA or RNA or whatever would naturally replicate. So by introducing a series of proteins called polymerases and then other genetic material that would allow DNA to replicate, the polymerase will take – uh, pieces of floating genetic material and use it to make copies essentially of whatever genetic material you've introduced into the reaction. So by the process of heating cycles in the right chemical composition, you can get these proteins essentially, or in this case, nucleic acids or whatever else to replicate themselves in order to expand the amount of material that is there. And then you can do whatever you want with the materials. And like sometimes one of the things we'll do in our laboratory is uh, run 
uh, agarose gels with it to test for the presence of a certain gene. So you, if you know the molecular weight roughly of a genetic project or a product, you can put it on a gel. When the gel runs, it'll form a band. Uh, if anybody ever watches like Law and Order or CSI or whatever, when they do DNA tests and they like stick the DNA test up on that backlight wall and you see all the little bands across the wall or across the printout, that's showing mm -hmm. like the different bands that have formed from this particular genetic printout. And most of the ones they put on for TV are like nonsensical, but it looked cool for the camera. Um, with the like the idea that the coronavirus doesn't exist because they didn't have every strain of the virus genotyped in December or January of the year that the thing became into existence is nonsense. Um, if you set like, that's like saying that because we can't identify every particular mutation that's ever existed in the flu, then the common cold doesn't exist. Like it's not <laughs> the same. It's if you can test for a, virus that's uh, you can go back to the coke postulates at that point which is if you isolate a a pathogen from one person or one sick animal or organism isolate that put it in another organism and say that it causes the same disease in the next organism you've identified the pathogen like pcr not needed we know what the thing is we knew what it was before we could genotype it but now that we have the genotype for it we can test for a series of genes that have been identified with the novel coronavirus version 2019 or whatever the actual full legal name of this virus is <laughs> and say that we can test for it. The tests are pretty accurate. Um, you can say what you want about like how many people have it and are asymptomatic. But I mean, if you tested everyone for every particular pathogen that they could be carrying at any given time, you'd probably find all kinds of things that you're asymptomatic for. But if you can still spread them, that's a problem. In this case, because you're, which is, I mean, which is why, like, they tell people if you're going into, like, intensive care units or, like, if you've ever been in a hospital in the neonatal ICU, no one's just, like, wearing your regular clothes from outside, not washing your hands and picking up newborn babies in there. That's not a thing because you're carrying things that could potentially kill this person. Um, in the case of the coronavirus, if you're worried that the virus doesn't actually exist, you're an idiot. We've we found it. We've <laughs> like we found it. We found the genetic materials for it. And despite an unholy amount of misinformation about it, it's pretty straightforward what it is and what it does. We don't you know, know exactly, you know, what the long term effects of it are going to be. Uh, one of the things that happened on TV today um, that was actually interesting is that it's being reported that one of the University of Florida basketball players who had COVID before the season started collapsed during a basketball game and is now in the ICU in Florida because uh, they collapsed during a basketball game. And we don't know if that's because COVID is going to have severe long-term reactions or long-term effects on people who are, are physically exerting themselves at a high level. Um, are, do we know everything about COVID? Absolutely not. But does it exist? Yes. Are you an absolute jackass for saying that the virus is fake? Yes. Hey, are, you an outland are you an outlandish jackass for taking medical advice from a person who has repeatedly paid out millions of dollars for making false medical claims on their personal website? Yes. That's Mercola, <laughs> just, to be, just to be clear. Hey, I don't think we really hey, talked Jordan. about who he is. I, I really up? have to give you some pushback on that. Um, because what I heard you say, and, and this, is, this is incredible to me, is that law and order doesn't use real science. Is, is that your <laughs> Or claim? CSI. Or I CSI. Always, I, don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm, I'm rejecting that. <laughs> Fake news. It's literally election fraud. Election fraud. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, all this election fraud. Hey, can, Blue, can we get well, the law and the order ding problem. ding in here? <laughs> Lou Rockwell won the election and the deep the deep state leftists are trying to cheat him out of victory. I think that's basically <laughs> what we've established here. Is that, and everyone who believes it is only hilarious. believing it because of the vaccine damage done to their brains. Exactly. <laughs> what and the mighty what I find hilarious about the election, I mean, because 
going into the election, my one real hope was that it, we would have an unambiguous result. And that hope was shattered by 2020, like, you know, freeze it, take a big hammer to it, take all the pieces and, and, and put them on their own nuclear bombs and boom, there goes my hope. I mean, but, here's um, the thing about the, the election results is that they kind of came out exactly like, I'm, I'm, if you believe any mathematical model of it, they came out exactly as predicted, which is Biden won the popular vote because there was no one, based on the models from 2016, there is no reason to believe that Trump was going to win the popular vote either time. It was a toss up as to whether or not he was going to win the electoral college because in all of the swing states, it was real close. Like he right. won his, his vote, the vote totals in the swing states or the states that are, I don't know how we're going to define swing states now because there's a few that have changed, but his vote totals were very close in the swing states, but the, popular vote wasn't close at all um it's pretty straightforward as to what it was but we also knew that since like february of this year or before he was claiming voter fraud in advance because he knew <laughs> somewhere in there that he was not going to win the popular vote because he knew he didn't win the popular vote last time and he, he definitely wasn't going to win the popular vote yeah and he knew he wasn't going to win the popular vote in the middle of an economic reception or recession that was brought on by a pandemic, which he <laughs> called fake until he, way too late to deal with it. But he won Red the election by a landslide. Red we'll wave see. all the way. A, uh, a red tsunami. Uh, what I find hilarious watch. about the election, though, is um, we we're about to see Democrats actually propping up the Electoral College. <laughs> right. I I, we're, like, how, I don't think we're going to see that. How is that? I I don't think we're going to see them propping up the electoral college. I think we're going to see them saying, "These are the rules that you won by last time. We well, won right, by them." That's time. what I mean. That's, but they're that's also what I'm saying is they're going to be like there's also the a massive voted, call from up. the Democrat to abolish the electoral college entirely immediately, which they can't do without the Senate, but. Well, they also can't do it without two thirds of the states, right? I mean, they're yeah. they're not going to do it. But I I like have not fourths? seen the Democrat defending the electoral college. I've just seen them say that like he also won the electoral college. But I mean, he won the popular vote by what like seven million. It was something pretty high. Is it seven or is it closer to eight now? It's fake news. No. I, <laughs> well, the only it, thing, I mean, I, it's before, Matt the electoral, communism. before the electoral college is abolished, the, the interstate compact will, will beat that if that ever passes, you know, if that ever gets to the point of 270, I don't know, but, um, but that's what will, I, I mean, that's, a, that's what will, uh, that's what will eventually get rid of the electoral college more likely than the actual amending of the constitution. There, there's a serious question about the constitutionality of that. I mean, the, the, I'm pretty sure that the states can't make that compact. But couldn't that's they an argument bind for their, the Supreme could, Court. Could they bind their electors to it? It could because... They can choose their electors, but they're they're essentially entering into a diplomatic compact with the other states, and they're not allowed to do that. There's there's a clause in there somewhere. Okay, I'll have to dig. I'll have to dig up on that. Yeah. Uh, to kind of see because I mean, states can choose how they choose the the electors, and if they choose the national popular vote, I guess I mean, is it defined as an interstate compact or is it just a resolution that? Oh, well, it's literally named that. Asked, <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, it is named that. It's, I guess it depends. Yeah, I, you know, I guess, yeah, I'll have to dig on that one a little bit more. I like to dig in on that stuff, so I'll have to, I'll have to find out more about it. I mean, we're definitely getting into territory where the founders would be pulling their hair out, <laughs> <laughs> whatever hair they have left. I mean, like I mean, those wigs. I mean, but we also abolished slavery, so about half of them would have already like lost their entire fucking minds 150 <laughs> years ago. Okay, well, aside from that, yes, okay, but 
Well, we banned alcohol at it's one, one of the time, things, too. Like, they probably wouldn't have founders, like, like, what would they think? And it's also like, who the fuck cares what the founders think? <laughs> right. They're, I mean, they are dead. So Even, oh, even oh, Jefferson in some of his writings was just like, no one should care what we think in 30 years. Like, hit the reset oh, that, button uh, and do it again. Yeah, that every generation needs a revolution or something like that. Yeah. It's just yeah. like that. Okay, do we have anything else we want to cover today? No, I I don't think so. Um, I've, I'm definitely I'm definitely gonna dig in on on this <laughs> Rothbard Rockwell ah. report, though. It's going to be uh, uh, there, there's a lot of interesting things. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, I'll post the link to that somewhere because we found a whole archive uh, of the Rothbard Rockwell report. Like it's it used to be like a physical newsletter, and we have like. I don't know, like what seven years of it? Yeah, it is ninety eight. It was monthly. Yeah. Um, so you know, some of them had a, a few articles. There. Some of them, you know, like seven, eight articles. Eight years, April nineteen ninety to November nineteen ninety eight. One hundred and two issues. But if you're wondering where the paleo strategy comes from, it's our our boy Lou right here. No. Yeah. And Are if you're wondering why it corresponds. Yeah, I was going to say, like, if you're wondering why every time Lou Rockwell gets popular coincides with a Democrat winning the presidency. Not a direct <laughs> correlation, but maybe there might be some interplay between people realizing that conservatives are heavily motivated by racism and Democrats winning elections. Throwing <laughs> that one out there, you dumbasses. <laughs> All right. So Archie or Jordan, you got anything else you want to touch on? Or are we good to wrap up? Uh, yeah, just to everyone who's listening to our show just because they hate us and um, are going to talk about how nobody who likes Rockwell is actually a racist. Uh, happy Hanukkah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just, I'll just wrap this up uh, with letting everyone know that we learned today that the Mighty Ducks 2 is white genocide. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, thanks to all the other hosts for coming on, and we'll see you in two weeks. See ya.